Amen. All right, the title of the sermon this evening is A Warning to Shepherds, or A Warning to Pastors. Here in 1 Peter chapter number 5, verses 1 through 2, what we have is certain admonitions, certain tips, or certain advice that are given to pastors, or given to shepherds of flocks. Whether this be numerous churches, or whether it be a specific church, we see admonitions given to them of what to do specifically. But not only that, we see warnings of what to stay away, away from. We see written by, of course, the Holy Ghost warnings and precautions given to pastors and shepherds of what type of snare that they could fall into, what kind of problem that a pastor or a shepherd could fall into. And right here in verse number two, what we see really is the most common and what pastors really need to look out for, the most common snare that destroys a pastor and destroys a pastor's ministry, and that is pride. I want you to look with me here. We'll begin in verse number one. The Bible says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse number two. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Then he says this. Not by constraint, saying not like you're forced to do it, but willingly. So not forced in a forced way, but that you want to do it, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, saying, saying money should not compel you. That shouldn't be the reason why you're doing this, right? And then he says, but of a ready mind. That's again meaning willingly, right? Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but in one gospel when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's praying, he says the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You compare that, there's another gospel where he's praying. It says, the spirit indeed is ready, but the flesh is weak. The word ready just means willing. That's what it's saying. A person that's ready to do something or wanting or willing to do it. That's what this means here. It says, but of a ready mind. Saying a willing mind. Saying, you should, be, you should desire this job. You shouldn't be forced in any way, whatever it may be. You know, and he gives a specific example, because oftentimes people will feel that you know, this is maybe a, a wicked person may feel, hey, this is a good way to get a paycheck, right? So they'll do it for filthy lucre's sake. Look at what it says there in verse number 3. We see another <clears throat> uh, warning here. This is what I want to focus on this evening, verse number 3. It says this, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So we see a warning here that says, Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So I'm going to be focusing on this concept, and I'm going to be explaining to you what this means throughout the evening. Once we establish what it means... I'm going to be showing you in scriptures how this is very common for pastors and uh, other ways that people can fall into this and what exactly it's speaking of. Now, <clears throat> this evening's sermon is going to be very closely related, of course, to this morning's sermon because there is so much confusion that's being spread around about the subject of shepherd, bishop, as I've mentioned already. And this is a very, this is a paramount subject. It's extremely, extremely important to have the right authority structure. So we need to be rooted and founded in this and we need to know why our church is the type of church that it is. We are a church of pastoral authority, not deacon authority. You know, we are a church of pastoral authority. And I want to address, I'm going to go over something real quick, and it may seem redundant from this morning. It may seem repetitive from this morning, but I want to go over some verses. We're going to fly through them real quick because you already should be familiar with them. I want you to turn with me first to Hebrews chapter number 13. So this is first by way of introduction. We're going to review a few clear verses, very important Verses. I want to go ahead and nip something in the bud real quick. Like I said, I talked about it already this morning. But then oftentimes people will turn you to 1 Peter 5 to try to prove that a pastor has no authority. When the Bible just over and over and over again speaks that the pastor is over the flock. Set a man over the congregation, right? Now, you know, like I said, this may seem redundant too bad. It's super important. So let's look at these verses we're going to establish very clear. This is specific and at hand right now. It's very important. We're going to establish these verses and see that the pastor, that there are rulers in the church, and it is the bishop, it is the pastor, and he has authority. Look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 7. It says this, Remember them which have the rule over you. House churches don't like that. The rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. This is the man feeding the flock with knowledge, right? Whose faith follow. Notice that they're an example considering the end of their conversation. Conversation means their lifestyle there. It's not talking about the things they speak. Conversation in the Bible is talking about the way they live. 
It says the end of their conversation. Notice that there are godly examples as far as the way they live their life. You look at Hebrews 13, 17. Same chapter, verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account and so forth and so forth. Look at verse number 24, same chapter. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Look with me at verse number 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 12. The Bible reads, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you. Notice these are the people that are doing the work. Which labor among you. And then it says this, And are over you in the Lord. Notice the same exact wording each time. Rule, over. You know, it said obey. Look at uh, Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28. We saw this earlier. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28. It says this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. There is no question, no question at all that there is authority in the church. And there are people that are over the church that are supposed to be obeyed, that the flock is supposed to submit to. And they are supposed to rule over the church. There is no way that you can just take 1 Peter chapter number 5 and say, well, that just means you're not the boss. That just means that you're not the ruler. That just means that people don't have to obey you. That is not, <clears throat> excuse me, what 1 Peter chapter number 5 is teaching at all. There are so many clear scriptures that talk about there being an authority, and specifically the pastor and the bishop being the authority of the church. So we had rule over you, we had obey, and then we saw very clearly where it says they that are over you in the Lord. Now I want to say this in the very beginning. Just like with any authority, any position of authority, the power can be abused, can't it? If you see people that are given any type of authority, of course, that power can be taken and abused. And because, of course, we are humans, we're all susceptible to pride, aren't we? And oftentimes when uh, you know, a, an authority or a power is taken and abused, what's the reason why they're doing so? Because they become very prideful. A person will become very prideful and they begin abusing this type of authority, right? Well, this is why this warning is so much more even important. Because we know we're human. We know the heart is deceitful. We know that we're, we, we, we have a proclivity to pride. God clearly establishes authority in the church. He clearly establishes certain people to be over in the church. So that automatically, we, we know, that automatically is going to make them even more susceptible to pride, isn't it? So there needs to be a warning that goes forth to pastors. There needs to be a warning that goes forth to shepherds on this particular note. And the reason being is because if a pastor fails 99% of the time, I mean, I just pulled that you know, number out of my butt, but 90% of the time, most of the time, you know why they're going to fail? It's because of pride. When you see a fall of a man, a great man of God, it's because of pride. Right. Study it out in the Bible. It's always because of pride. So doesn't it make perfect sense that you would see a warning about pride and specifically about abuse of a power, abuse of power, abuse of authority? When we look at the Bible, we see example after example of great, humble men being lifted up in a position where God desires for them to be in that position, but then they end up falling because of pride. And you know what they start doing? They start abusing their power. And the reason why this is so important is because when they start abusing their power, there is no way that, 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 that you can do so without hurting the people that are under you. So what they end up doing is they end up taking advantage of those that are under them. They take that authority, they take that power, and then they use it for their own benefit. They use it for their own benefit, and they end up taking advantage of the people in their church. They end up taking advantage of the people in their ministry, whatever it may be. And they end up hurting the people that are in their church. God desires for men to be in this position. That's why he gives the warning, because he knows that there is a proclivity to this type of fall. So this is a snare that pastors will fall into. So what we, what we don't do is we don't you know, say, you know, uh, like some people will conclude. They'll say, you know, well, because people 
are more susceptible to pride, then we should just have no leadership. You should never take a man and put him into a position of leadership. That's what's known as, as a non sequitur. That's a logical fallacy. A non sequitur means that doesn't follow, right? Your reasoning, that's not what follows that, right? I'll give you an example in the Bible that debunks that. The husband. How much authority does the husband have in the household? How much? All of it. All of it. You know, that may make people uncomfortable, but it says, uh, you know, just as the church submits or is subject unto Christ, so let their wives be unto their own husbands. And then it says this, in everything, just in case you didn't understand that. Amen. That means everything. Everything means everything. All right. So the same way, how, now let me ask this question just to further prove that point. How subject is the church unto Christ? In that, exactly, that's what I was just here to say, in everything. So you know how subject the wife is to be to the husband? In everything. No, no exceptions. Amen. Now are there husbands that abuse that authority? Yes. Tons of them, everywhere. So do we conclude, therefore, he should not have that authority? <laughs> we need a 50-50 relationship? No, we don't do that. Amen. The, the authority still needs to be there. There has to be leadership. There has to be. Not, you will not succeed you know, on a project at any type of level if you do not have a leader that's running things. In any type of situation, there always has to be somewhere where the buck stops. There always has to be someone that, that, that's ready at any moment to you know, uh, uh, take control and to help out and to do all, make decisions and to be decisive. You have to have, it doesn't matter worldly, secular, it doesn't matter. In all situations of life, you have to have a leader at the top. You have to. Amen. So that does not follow. Okay, well, because uh, you know authority is abused, therefore you should not have authority in the first place, right? That that that's ridiculous. That's that is a logical fallacy. That can be a, you can use that in in so many different um, um, uh, ways and use examples to debunk that. So so that's obviously ridiculous. So what this is is a pastor. I, I want I want to say this too as well. I want to make this point before I move out of the introduction. <clears throat> A pastor is the most important office of any office in the entire world, and I really believe that. A pastor is more important than the President of the United States. Amen. I am more important than Donald Trump. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Every pastor across this nation is more important than any political leader. Amen. His decisions affect the temporary now and here, and that's it, and it ends. And you'll move on, and then another nation will be established, and all over again. But a pastor is dealing with eternal souls. Right. And he is affecting things that are eternal. He's affecting eternal souls. He's watching over the souls of his church. Amen. He's helping out and benefiting people for eternity. Gaining words, rewards for eternity. And not only that, he should be reaching the people in his area and affecting their eternity. Their eternal destination. That's a lot more important than anything, any decision Donald Trump's ever made in his life. I can right. guarantee you that. Amen. So when you understand how important the office is, and then you, you understand how it makes you more susceptible as a pastor, how pastors have a warning that's given to them. Hey, you need to be careful about this. You need to be careful about pride creeping in because it will destroy you and it will destroy everyone in your church and everyone around you. Pastors need to take heed. Amen. Shepherds need to take heed. This is a very, very important topic. So I want to begin here in 1 Peter chapter 5. I want to look at this one more time just to keep it in your mind. We're going to just, I'm just going to read it, review it, then we're going to move on. And I want to, because I'm going to explain it to you by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Which one went the wrong way? 1 Peter chapter number 5. Look there one more time at verse number 3. This is what I'm going to explain. This verse right here. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Now, do we interpret that? Is it possible in light of the rest of the Bible to interpret that as, you're not supposed to be the ruler? No. That's ridiculous, isn't it? It's, it, it's not possible. Okay? So, the, for the people that just have a problem with authority, and, and, and I, I even heard this recently. I've heard a man say literally this. There should be, there, there should never be a man that's over the congregation. It's like you just literally quoted Numbers 27. Literally. There should never be one man that's over all, you know, other men. That's not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. And then people will try to point to this to prove that. That's not what this is teaching at all. This is a warning to a man that is proud, and he is prideful, and he's taking advantage of his church. I want you to 
Turn with me to Mark chapter number 10. Mark chapter number 10. Jesus explains to us what a leader is supposed to be like. In Mark chapter number 10, how a Christian leader is supposed to be. He's, of course, speaking to his disciples. Mark chapter number 10, verse number 42. This actually, this passage right here interprets for us 1 Peter chapter number 5. Uh, let's, let's back up a little bit, actually. Look at verse 35. It says this, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, and in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, You know not what ye ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can and Jesus said unto them, You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with, with all, shall you be baptized. Then he says this, But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Then it says this, And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. Now when you compare Scripture to Scripture, one of the other Gospels the other account that's given, it actually says uh, uh, even more so that during this same time that they were arguing with one another, who would be the greatest, right? So they're sitting there and they're, I want you to notice something, that they're, they are desiring. They desire just to have, if you will, the preeminence. They desire to be the greatest just for what purpose? To help serve others? Of course not. It's just to be the greatest. Why? For pride. For the purpose of pride. Now, that's obviously the exact opposite of humility, isn't it? The exact opposite. Because they just want the glory and the honor of the position of being over people. So, I want you to keep that in mind. So, at this same time, they're arguing with one another about who should be the greatest. Who's the greatest? Like one person's like, hey, I'm the greatest! You know, and then Peter's like, come on, man. I'm Peter, you know? Huh. And then they go back and forth. Look at verse 42. But Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, notice this, exercise lordship over them. That sound familiar? That's what we saw in 1 Peter 5. <clears throat> and their great ones exercise authority upon them. Verse 43. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you, I want you to watch this, shall be your minister. Now what does it mean to minister? It's the person that's doing the work. It's a servant. Look at the next verse, verse 44. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, so this is the man that's the greatest, this is the man that has the authority, or he has the rulership, or the lordship, if you will. He has the power. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. Now watch verse 45 to help us interpret all of this. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, when Jesus Christ came on this earth, to further explain this, did, did when he was with his disciples, was this like a 50-50, a board of democracy where they were all voting on things? Is that how it worked? No. Jesus Christ was the shepherd. Amen. What did that mean? He was calling the shots. Right. When they're going soul winning and they have a ministry, he's there getting things ready. He says, hey, go get ready for the Passover. He's giving commands. He's giving orders, right? He was the boss. Who's preaching the word of God? He's preaching the word of God, isn't he? And he's preaching it with authority. When people are gathered together, he's feeding the flock. Right. He's the shepherd. He's the one preaching to the congregation. He's the one always correcting and rebuking them. He is the one that is in charge, isn't he? Amen. He's the chiefest of all. Was, were, were the other people telling him what to do? No, that's ridiculous, right? Or, or, or his disciples coming up to him and, and saying, hey, I don't think things should run like that. Let me give you a suggestion here. Of course not, right? Jesus was the bishop. Amen. Jesus ruled over them. He was the man that was set over that congregation, wasn't he? There's no question about that. You can read all about Jesus was the boss, right? But you know what Jesus did? Jesus did the work. Jesus served. Jesus ministered. Now, we have an interpretation here of what it means to exercise lordship. He says this in verse 45 one more time. For even the Son of Man, watch this, came not to be ministered unto. That's a person exercising lordship. That's a, a Gentile that's exercising lordship. You know what it is? It's a man standing there and exercising his authority. 
You know what he's doing? He's just telling other people to do the work. You know what he's doing? While he's doing that, he's standing back and just allowing them to work while he does nothing. He's allowing them to do all the work and he just sits back and does nothing. He just watches them. He's exercising his lordship. But then it says this. It contrasts that and says, but to minister. Saying he came to actually do the work. But to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now when we look at 1 Peter chapter number 5. It says, neither is being lords over God's heritage. And it says this, but being what? In samples to the flock. Do you know what in samples is talking about? Saying you're actually the one doing the work. Saying you're not just yelling out orders. You're just not giving commands. You're not just like the Gentile supervisor or like the taskmaster that has a whip, right? Saying fulfill your task, right? And whipping people and then just standing back. That's what it's talking about of exercising lordship. Yeah, you have the role, Peter, as an elder, as a bishop, as a shepherd. Yeah, the pastor has the power, but he shouldn't just stand back. He shouldn't just, you know, uh, uh, scream out orders and then just sit around and do nothing. Amen. And allow people to minister unto him. Just minister unto me while I just sit on my lazy butt, right? right. That's what Jesus is preaching against. And that's what the warning is about in 1 Peter chapter number 5. It's not talking about, hey, you shouldn't be the boss. Stop trying to be the boss. Stop, stop trying to make decisions. The Bible is so clear. I mean, you, you would have to be, you, well, it's not even that these people are stupid. So I'm not even going to call them stupid, idiot, retard anymore. They're dishonest. Right. They're like six verses in the New Testament that command you to submit to the leadership in the church. They tell you to obey them that have the rule over you. It even uses the word submit. It says those that labor among you. What are they being? They're being in samples to the flock. That's what it's talking about. That is what it's teaching. Over and over and over again, it tells you three times in Hebrews 13. Three times. Verse number 7, verse number 17, and verse number 24. It tells you, obey them which have the rule over you. You know who they are? They're the ones that are teaching you the word of God. They're overseeing you. <clears throat> They're watching for your soul. Amen. Bishop, shepherd. Those are, that is the ruler in the church. Right. But you know what that person shouldn't be doing? They shouldn't be coming you know, and expecting to exercise lordship. Just exercise their power and be ministered unto. They, that's why pastors oftentimes are called ministers. The pastor should be doing more work than any other person at the church. Amen. The pastor should be just laboring all the time. That's the job of a pastor. If you want to be a pastor... You should be working all the time. Amen. You should be a hard worker because that is the job of a pastor. Because it's not, you know, set up to where everybody just ministers unto me. You know, just give me some grapes and I'm going to lay back and you can just drop them in my mouth. That's ridiculous. You know, you know, I'm not doing that to you either, okay? That's not what it means to minister. No, I'm just kidding. You know, the job of the pastor is to set the example. It's to lead by example. It's, it's, and it's not saying you don't work either. That's not what it's saying either. It's not like I carry the entire load and then everybody just walks behind me. Do you know what it is? It's I lead by example, being in sample, saying you should follow me. Man. I do the work, and then you follow me and do the same work. That's what it means. So you want to see some areas where pastors are failing, not going soul winning. Man. You know why? Because we're commanded to go soul winning. That's right. And if the pastor doesn't go soul winning, the church isn't going to go soul winning. Right. The church will not go soul winning. You know why? Because he's not leading as an example. Right. If the pastor's not charitable, you'll go into the church and you'll notice nobody's charitable. Right. If the pastor's not hospitable, the church won't be hospitable. Mm -hmm. Whatever spirit the pastor has, normally the church has. Yeah. You know, the, the pastors need to lead by examples. They need to be in samples to the flock. They need to not just, this is what this means, exercise lordship. They're just exercising their power, saying that's the only thing they're doing. They're just whipping people and giving orders, and that's all that they do. Just their authority, just their ruler, their, their, their rulership, right? As opposed to being an example and doing the work themselves. That's what 1 Peter 5 is warning against. And do you know when a pastor starts to do that, oftentimes, is when he becomes proud. And then he starts to abuse his authority, and then he starts to take advantage of the flock. I want you to turn with me now. We're going to see a couple of times in the Old Testament uh, warnings about pastors falling into this, where they're taking advantage of their congregants because of pride. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 23. <clears throat> Oops. 
Jeremiah chapter number 23. A lot of the same verses that we read this morning, just looking at them in a different light. Different. The, the Word of God is so deep, you can use the same verses, preach an entirely different sermon, focus on completely different things, and everybody can walk away with brand new knowledge. Amen. That's how deep the Word of God is. Amen. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 23, verse number 1. The Bible says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock, watch this, and driven them away. And then he says, and have not visited them. So notice if they don't care about them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them. And will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them. Which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So notice the first pastors. What did they do? They abused their authority, didn't they? And they destroyed the sheep. They harmed and, and hurt the sheep, right? Now did God just say, all right, no more authority given to anybody. Nobody's going to be over the congregation. You know, you guys are just, you, it just makes you guys too proud. Is that what he said? No, look at verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. So this, the solution is not just get rid of all authority. No, it's, it's let's put another man over them. You know, let's put a different guy over them, right? Let's put somebody in, in, in there that has the right heart and that cares for the sheep. Do you know when a pastor stops caring for the sheep? When he's, you have two options. They're, you're either going to be selfish or you're going to be selfless. It's when he's worried about himself. You know what he does is he starts taking advantage of everyone else, and he starts hurting them, and that's how you, they destroy the flock. Go to Ezekiel chapter 34. <clears throat> this is a famous chapter, of course, about the, the bad pastors. I like to refer to it as this. The bad shepherds versus the good shepherd. The bad shepherds versus the good shepherd. Of course, this is the, the famous chapter about the Lord Jesus Christ as our shepherd. Look at verse number 1. I don't know how much we're going to read down through here. There's a lot in here, so we'll begin right at the very beginning of the chapter. Look at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel, watch this, that do feed themselves. Look at that. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Now, what does that mean, they're feeding themselves? Are they doing work? That's the whole point. They're not doing the work, but they're just, they're just you know, uh, 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 shearing the sheep and taking what they have. They're allowing the sheep to do the work, and then they're just taking what they have, while they just sit back and do nothing, right? Now, furthermore, uh, keep in mind also what Jesus was teaching from Mark chapter number 10. How he talked about how, how the, uh, the, they exercise lordship. It's the same exact concept. What are they doing? They're just sitting back, and they're just telling other people what to do. As it, like as a taskmaster, so other people are working. While they're not working, what is their job? It's to preach the word of God. And he's saying they're not feeding the flock. They're not doing their job. They're not even preaching. They're not teaching the word of God. That's why everyone in Israel was ignorant of the law of God. Because they weren't doing their primary job. And what was it? To feed the flock. It was to feed the flock. So instead of feeding the flock, they weren't doing that at all. They weren't doing any work. They were still just taking advantage of the flock, weren't they? But they were still you know, feeding themselves instead of feeding the flock. The exact opposite. <clears throat> it's the same thing 1 Peter chapter 5 is teaching as well. You know, not, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but, but being examples to the flock. So what is this teaching again? Instead of them doing it, they're just taking from, from their flock. Look at verse number 3. Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed. Watch this. But ye feed not the flock. So what are they doing? They're not doing any work. They're not being an ensample or an example to the flock. And who are they worried about? Themselves. And they're not taking care of the flock. They're not taking care of the sheep. What ends up happening? It ends up harming the people in the church, doesn't it? Look at the next verse. Verse 4. The disease have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick. 
Neither have ye bound up that which was broken. Neither have ye brought again that which was driven away. Neither have ye sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have ye ruled it. So notice all this work that they're not doing. Notice all this work that they are not engaging in. Now, of course, there's a spiritual application to all this. He's speaking as if they are literal sheep and they are not literal sheep. We bind people up. Pastors are supposed to bind people up spiritually. They're supposed to help people spiritually by feeding them the Word of God so they can get sin out of their lives, so they can help them when they're down. You can you know, preach a sermon about the love of God or something, and, and, and it'll make you feel better, right? You know, you know, we don't toss out all the positive and just preach on negative. Sometimes people are down and depressed, and they need a, a sermon on being comforted, don't they? About the comfort of God, about the Holy Spirit, and God's love for us. Sometimes that's what people need. You know what? The pastor, when he's not worried about the people, you know, he'll just preach, you know, whatever brings the money in. You know what he's able to do then? I'm just, neek, 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 just keep sharing the sheep. But he's not really binding them up, is he? He's not really feeding them with knowledge, is he? He's just preaching to them what tickles their ears. He's just preaching to them what they want to hear. But he's not really visiting the sick. He's not really helping the spiritual problem, is he? He's just giving them what they want. But then he keeps taking, he, he just keeps taking from the flock, doesn't he? Just keeps shearing the flock and taking what he wants. Because why? Because he's just worried about himself. So he's not doing the work. Then he just takes whatever the sheep have. <clears throat> Down there at the bottom, notice what it says, Neither have ye sought that which was lost. Then it says this, But with force and with cruelty have ye ruled them. What does that sound like? So he's telling them they're not working. Right? They're not doing their job. But then you're taking from them. Now, somebody may look at this and say, Well, see? They shouldn't be ruling them. You. you it's frustrating. The problem is not that they're ruling them. The problem is that they are ruling them with force and with cruelty. Right. The problem is that they are ruling over them. They are exercising lordship, my friend. That is what is commanded in 1 Peter 5, not to exercise lordship. That is what Jesus taught his disciples. He set the example as being the boss, and he ruled over the disciples. He was the one that they submitted to. Do you know what he didn't do? He didn't rule them with force and with cruelty. He, he cared for them. He bound them up. He still ruled. You know, it's just like, it, it's the same example with the husband. You know, if, if, what if a husband's abusing his power? And somebody said to him, hey, you shouldn't rule with force and cruelty. Does that mean he shouldn't be ruling at all? No. The, he wouldn't say, he wouldn't point out the fact that they're ruling with force and cruelty. He would point out the fact that they're usurping authority that they shouldn't have in the first place if that was the problem. Right. He wouldn't say, you're ruling with force of cruelty. Stop ruling them at all. That doesn't make any sense. The problem is, is that they're doing it with force and with cruelty. The whole reason, as I mentioned this morning, that it's likened unto a shepherd is because a shepherd is a bishop of the sheep, but specifically a shepherd leads as a leader, and he does so gently. He's supposed to lead them gently. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11 says this. He shall lead, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm. And carry them in his bosom. And then it says this, and shall gently lead those that are with young. The job of the shepherd or of the pastor is to lead those in his congregation or to lead his flock gently. He should do so with a caring and a sincere heart. He should love the people that are in his congregation and he should seek to help them. He should be looking at their spiritual needs and looking at the problems maybe that he, that he can see or maybe just any possible problem. You know, he should care for the people in his flock. If somebody's maybe trying to teach somebody a false doctrine or somebody's falling into something wrong, you know what that, the best thing that that shepherd or that pastor can do is warn them. That's a big part of what the overseer is warned uh, or is ad, uh, uh, admonished to do in Acts 20. He warns them, Paul tells them, hey, grievous wolves are going to enter in among you. Not sparing the flock. You know what he's telling them to do? You need to watch out. You need, you need to take the oversight. Job. You need to protect the sheep. That's the job of the, of the pastor. He shouldn't be looking out for himself. He should be looking out for the people in his congregation. He should be caring about those that, that are in the church. Amen. Or in the congregation, he should be caring about the flock. Does that mean that he has no authority? This is silly. It's silly we even have to explain this. No, he has authority, but he should rule them gently. And he should... And just as a husband has all authority in the household, the husband is told to have a self-sacrificial love. And the decisions that the husband makes should not be 
to please himself or to please his own belly. He shouldn't be just taking whatever he can, taking advantage of his family, and taking advantage of his wife. You know what he should be doing? He should be making sacrificial decisions for his family. It's this exact same thing that a pastor is supposed to do. This is just Christian character in general. This is the same thing, the same advice that Christ gave his disciples about them as spiritual leaders is the exact same advice that should be given to the spiritual leader of a family, which is the husband. This is Christian character when it comes to leadership. Humility, being selfless, and caring about, just being sincere and caring about others and loving others. I want you to look now, let's keep reading. Look, for, look at verse 5. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field. And they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth. None did seek or seek after them. Notice, it's, it'd be like an example of if somebody came and visited our church and came here for a while. And, you know, we were considered like a member of the church, right? And we just didn't try to reach out to them at all. You know, that would be an example of that. That would be an example where it's like we just don't care about them. We don't care about these people. You know, that should be the job of the pastor. If somebody that, that attends our church just stopped coming, can you imagine... Can you imagine if just the Hall family just stopped coming? Or the Box family just stopped coming and I just never reached out to them? That's, that's what it's talking about. They don't even search or try to seek them out. They're just like, hey, get out of here. You kind of experienced that, didn't you? In the past. Not for me, all right? Or just, that's the, and you know what that comes from? It comes from pride. There's enough sheep already there. I already have these 99. Who cares about that one? I'm getting enough. You know, uh, a wool from what I have here. I got enough wool here. It's, it's, it's selfishness. It's just you're worried about yourself. You should care about the spiritual condition as a pastor of those that are in your flock. You shouldn't be worried about yourself at all. It should be about the people that are in your church. Amen. Look what it says next there, verse number 7. We're going to read a few more verses here. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord as I live, saith the Lord God. Surely, because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field. Watch, watch the accountability of the pastor here. Because there was no shepherd, neither did my, my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds, look at this, fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. Notice, it says in Hebrews chapter 13, as we read in verse 17, it says that obey them and submit to them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls as those that should give, should give an account. Just like here, what are these shepherds doing? They're giving an account, aren't they? And what were they doing? They were ruling with force and cruelty. They were exercising lordship. Notice the consistency here. And then what do they do? They're taking advantage of those. What is a supervisor doing? Think of a taskmaster, like, like, like Egyptian taskmasters. What are they doing? Of course, that's like a perfect example of Gentile lordship, exercising lordship, where they're just beating people and just forcing them to do all the work while they do none. That's what Christ is saying. That's not how it works in, in Christian spiritual leadership. You do the majority of the work, leader. You do the majority of the work, and you don't take advantage of the people in your church. You do the majority of the work, and you set the example, and they will follow. This guy, what are these shepherds doing? They don't care about their flock. They're all in it for what? Filthy lucre. They're all in it for themselves, aren't they? That's all that they care about. And they're trying to take advantage of the, the people in the church. They're, what they're doing is they're abusing the authority, and they're abusing the power that they were giving. What were they doing? They were ruling them with force, and they were ruling them with cruelty, just like a Gentile lord. Notice that consistency? I want you to turn with me now. Look at this last example. This has been brought up numerous times. It's somewhat off subject, so I want to give you some real meat that you can learn from. Go to 3 John now. 3 John. 3 John. The old Diotrephes argument. And it fits in perfect right now, what we're talking about. Because, because, let me say this. I don't even know if Diotrephes was a pastor. He may not have even been a pastor. You don't have a clue what he was. He might have been usurping authority that was not even his. 
That could be what the problem is here. But I'll give it to you that, hey, let's say maybe he's a pastor. Maybe he's a shepherd. I don't know that. There's no way to be able to tell that. But if he is a pastor, if he is a shepherd, he's a perfect example of someone that is exercising lordship. He's a perfect example of someone that is, that is ruling, not gently, but ruling with cruelty and ruling with force, and he's doing it for himself. What did the what were the um, the disciples trying to uh, uh, argue about? What were they arguing about? Who was the greatest? Who was the greatest? What did they desire? The preeminence. They desired the preeminence. And what is Jesus' response? A ruler is supposed to minister to others, not have others minister unto him, right? And he uses himself as the example, which we look at Jesus, and he was definitely the ruler. We look at the New Testament, and it is so clear that there is supposed to be. And I've even heard, I've even heard the wording of like, see, he desires the preeminence, and no man should be over. Talking about diatrophies, no man should be over the congregation. You know, I, you're going to have to rewind. If you're listening to the sermon, you're going to have to rewind it and listen to the other five verses that, we, that, I, that I quoted. It is so clear that there is supposed to be authority and there are supposed to be rulers over the congregation. So the problem, again, it's the same, it's the same logical fallacy. The problem is not the fact that these people have authority and that they have power. It's that they are abusing it and they are going about it the wrong way. A man that desires the preeminence is all in it for himself. I'll give you another example. Is there anything wrong with having money? No. Is there something wrong with desiring money? You see the difference? They're not the same thing, my friend. Jesus would not rebuke someone for having authority. I think he would just rebuke the people that have authority and that are ruling the church, the rulers. That he, Holy Scripture commands you to be obedient to those that rule over you. They're supposed to be bishops. You know, speaking by the Holy Ghost... Paul talks about those that have the oversight, the overseers. You know, Moses said, set a man over the congregation, right? That's super clear. So this is, this is what Jesus, but you know what he did rebuke them for? For desiring the preeminence. Because you know why? That's a man that would exercise lordship. That's a man that would go outside and abuse his power. Now, look at 3 John. I want you to look at verse number 9. I wrote unto the church... But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Now, right off the bat, what does that look like? looks like somebody who desires or loves to have the preeminence. Well, who are they in this for? Themselves. What are they doing? It's a person that's going to be exercising lordship. They desire to be the greatest. Right? Look at what it says in verse number 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth. And then it says this. Prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. So, so it's saying he's not content with what he has. So what this could be is it could be saying that he has power and he has authority, but he's not content with it. He just desires more power and more authority. You know what he's doing? He's usurping authority. He's acting outside of his bounds. Keep reading. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren. Now, does that sound good? Do you think Paul's rebuking him for not receiving, like, you know, fornicators and idolaters, the people that Paul said you're not allowed in the church? Does that make sense? He's rebuking him and saying that it's wrong that he's not receiving the brethren because these are good brethren that he should receive. That's the problem. You notice that? It's not that he's exercising authority. It's what he's doing with his authority. He's ruling with force and cruelty. And it says, and forbidding them that would. So forbidding others to receive the brethren. Now, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 5 about certain people, you know, fornicator, idolater, railer, extortioner, right? A drunkard. What does he say? Not coming here with them. Yeah, exactly. With such a one know not to eat. So what's the command from the church? Or to the church from Paul? Not to be around these people. You think Paul, or I'm sorry, this is uh, uh, John writing this. I think I said Paul earlier. Do you think John is rebuking these people for accompanying with people that the Holy Spirit says don't accompany with them? If, if, if the, the ruler of the church is saying, hey, don't be with those people, when it's a fornicator, it's some, a group of people that the Bible says don't be around, John's like, you know, he's forbidding those that would be with the brethren. Of course, these are people that, that you should be fellowshipping with. Good brethren, and he is what? He is usurping his authority. He's, he's not, I'm sorry, not usurping authority. He's abusing his authority. And he is ruling with force and cruelty. And he's, and he's 
ruling unrighteously. He's making bad decisions. Why? Because he desires the preeminence. Or he loves the preeminence. Then it says this, and casteth them out of the church. Verse 11. Beloved, watch what it says right after that. Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. So, why is that right after that whole passage? Because it's not the fact that he has authority. If he is the pastor, of course. The problem is, is what he's doing is evil with his authority. He is ruling with force and he's ruling with cruelty. He loves the preeminence. It's exactly the, 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 the subject when Jesus is like, hey, don't exercise lordship. The man that loves the preeminence, he desires that position of authority just to receive the honor for pride. He has the heart to where he's going to take advantage of other people. He has a heart where all he wants is the position. He doesn't have a humble heart where he wants to get in the position to where to do work. He just wants to be in the position himself, for himself, because he wants to abuse others. He wants to take advantage of others. That's clearly what Diotrephes. Diotrephes, if he was a bishop, there's one of two options here. He, number one, is usurping authority that is not his, and he is not a bishop, and he's acting as if he is, which I don't, I, you can't prove that he is even a bishop. You can't even prove that. I wouldn't even argue with you. Maybe he is when it says, and not content therewith. He's not content maybe with the authority that he has. He's even, he, he's even stopping the apostles from coming. If this man's just a regular bishop, he doesn't have more authority than the apostles. Do you understand how this guy is out of control, no matter how you look at it? But I don't believe that to be so, you know, I, I don't know. You can't make a decision whether or not he is a bishop or is a pastor. But let's just give it to them that maybe he is a bishop, maybe he is a pastor. Do you know what the problem is? It's that he loves the preeminence. He wants to be the greatest. And do you know what happens? Jesus gave a warning about those that want to be the greatest, and he says, you'll exercise lordship over people. Let me explain something to you. You need to understand that it's not just to be the greatest so you can rule over others to get to benefit. You need to understand before you go into the office of a bishop, your job is to minister unto others. Diotrephes is not doing that. That's, that's the problem with what Diotrephes is doing. That's the issue here. And not only that, he's unrighteously casting out people that should be in the congregation. Now, here's the thing. There, there is authority and power given to the pastor. But what if someone came in here that's just a good brother? And maybe, let's say, let's say this, maybe this is a, a good comparison of this, because notice what his motive is. He loves the preeminence. Why isn't he allowing the apostles to go? Because they have more authority than him. It's a prideful man. Let's, I'll give you an example. What if there's a pastor, and, and, and he is the pastor of a church where there is pastoral authority? And there's, let's say, a man in the church that, you know, is, let's say he just knows the Bible super well, maybe more than the pastor and then he just tries to get that guy and cast that guy out of the church. Just for no good reason. Would that be good or bad? Okay. Is the problem that he has... And these, this is... I'm speaking to people that understand pastoral authority, that the pastor is the one that makes the decisions. Is the problem that he has the authority to throw that guy out of the church or that he just threw someone out of the church? Is that the issue here? No, it's that he unrighteously judged. And why? Because he loves the preeminence. That's what it is. That is, this is the fear of the pastor. This is, if, if he's a pastor, this is a perfect example of a man that is exercising lordship. Where he's not, he's not serving others, he's serving himself. Jeremiah chapter number 17, verse number 15, I'll just read it to you real quick. It says this, Behold, they say unto me, Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. The passage where Jeremiah talks about himself being a pastor. He says this then, as for me, watch this, I have not hastened from being a pastor, and he says, to follow thee. Notice that. Notice when he says he's being a pastor, he says, I haven't hastened from being a pastor. He's saying he hasn't left from being a pastor. He says, to follow thee. And then he goes on, neither have I desired the woeful day. Thou knowest, that which came out of my lips was right before thee. So, notice when he's talking about being a pastor, he said he hasn't hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. You know what a pastor does? He sets the example. Just like Paul said, follow me even as I follow Christ. Amen. You know what a pastor does? He sets the example for everybody else. He doesn't just make everybody else do the work. 
What did Christ do? He came to be an example for us. Did he not have authority? Did he not rule? You know? If people have trouble reconciling thoughts sometimes, and they get something in their minds. I give some people with the benefit of the doubt that just have issues with this, and it's not just rebellious, you know, a rebellious heart. Both coexist. You have, you know, God wants there to be a man or the congregation that has authority and has power, and he's ruling. And he's making decisions, pastoral authority. But he shouldn't be ruling with force and cruelty. The pastor should not be ruling for himself and not doing any work and not feeding the flock and just feeding himself. He needs to be doing the work. He needs to be setting the example. And a pastor needs to be following God. He needs to be following the Lord. He needs to be setting the example. And as Paul said, follow me even as I follow Christ. That's the perfect example. Of, that's a perfect uh, quote right there of how a pastor should be. That should be the personality of a pastor. They should be able to say, like, um, who was it that made the statement? Uh, you know, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Who was that? Jehu. Jehu, that's right. Jehu said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. That's the attitude that a pastor should have. A pastor should be someone that can set an example. Not someone just ruling with lordship. Not being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Let's bow our heads and have a word for it. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the warnings to the shepherds and pastors, and the warnings of pride and, and uh, just, uh, feeding themselves and not feeding the flock. And we ask you that you'd be with us, dear Lord, and be with all the pastors, dear God, and, and uh, that you would uh, help us to have an understanding of, of, of your word and of the authority structure of what we should be doing in all areas of the church. Just please enlighten our eyes, enlighten our hearts. Help us to be a church that's pleasing to you, dear Lord. Help us to... I have a humble heart if we're wrong about things to change, dear God. And uh, we ask you that you would be with all the children, be with all the families, dear Lord God, that, that aren't feeling well. And just protect everyone that is here tonight. Be with all of us. Just pour out a special blessing, showers of blessings upon all of us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 amen.